Thank you, Sarah. So um, I've had a couple of messages on my phone, people are asking for the Wi-Fi password. Apologies, I overlooked this. Um, the password is December with a capital D if anyone needs it. Okay, so moving on to our first technical session of the day. The, um, the overall theme of the day is around preserving the toolbox using integrated pest management. So we're gonna kick things off with Dr. Neil Paveley, who is head of crop protection at ADAS, who's going to be taking us through a presentation looking at a number of projects on integrated pest management. Thank you, Neil. Right, thank you, Emily. Good morning. Can you all hear me okay? That's good. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about IPM. Uh, we're going to hear from the voluntary initiative uh, in the next presentation. The VI, along with NFU, have been doing good work on IPM. Um, and one of the findings from that work, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, Phil, is that there's already quite a lot of IPM going on in UK farms. Uh, but also quite a lot of headroom for further uptake. So what I'm going to focus on is how that further uptake of IPM might be achieved. And a, a good starting point for that is to uh, look at the views of farmers about what they perceive as the barriers to increasing IPM uptake. I'm just going to start with some information that's come out of a, a series of interviews conducted by ADAS uh, with farmers uh, across uh, England, in this case, uh, as part of an environmental <coughs> land management test and trial project, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, but what I just wanted to pick out was, uh, this is um, the themes that came out from farmers when asked the question, what the barriers were that they perceived to increasing use of IPM. Uh, and you see there's quite a few of them that, uh, that come out, but if I just focus on the top three, uh, mindset or habits comes out quite strongly as a theme, uh, lack of understanding or knowledge of IPM, and economic factors as a, as a barrier. So perhaps none of that's very surprising. Um, I'm not a politician or a psychiatrist, so I'm not going to deal with mindset or habits because that's too difficult. Uh, but I think collectively, we can do something about lack of understanding and knowledge. Uh, but before dealing with that, I just want to dig down a bit further into the, into the economic barriers. Because when we then went on and said, well, can you explain what the economic barriers are that you perceive? Uh, again, perhaps not surprisingly, these are the topics and themes that that come up, um, lack of resources, it can be resource intensive, costs of implementation of IPM, and a financial risk associated with it. So this is, um, these are the themes that are coming out from farmers as, as barriers. So we just deal with these uh, economic points first, because these are a real cost and risk concerns, and one way they may be ameliorated to some extent would be through some kind of economic incentive towards IPM. And there is a prospect of such an incentive uh, through the SFI as part of environmental land management. Um, and I'm just gonna show a little bit of what's come out of a, the, the test and trial project uh, for IPM under ELM. So I've only got time to deal with three aspects of the project. Uh, one is what the barriers and incentives are, uh, which we've just shown some data from. Um, the second part is the creation of a land management planning tool for IPM, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, we've produced a, a tool for use on wheat, potatoes and grassland as example crops. Uh, and the third question we dealt with in the project was around uh, what the level of advice and guidance was that was needed in order to complete IPM land management plans. Uh, and to investigate that, we had 130 farms that took part in the project, 
uh, and we divided those into three groups. Uh, one group received just some very basic written guidance to help them complete this land management plan. Uh, others attended uh, IPM workshops run by ADAS and others received one-to-one -one guidance. So I'll just run through what we found from this work. And I should credit, well, I must credit the, the partners in the project. It was instigated uh, by the NFU, Chris Hartfield, uh, with Natural England in the first instance. It was funded by DEFRA uh, and it was delivered by colleagues in ADAS and SIUC. Okay, so this is a screenshot of one part of this IPM land management plan that we created. Uh, some of you in the room may have been involved in um, completing these alongside farmers. Uh, when you first go into the Excel file, uh, you just pick from a drop down menu which types of crops you grow. In this case, you click on wheat, a sheet for wheat appears. Uh, on that sheet, there's a series of three tables, uh, one for diseases, one for insect pests, and one for weeds. Uh, this is part of the table for insect pests. You can see the major pests of wheat are listed across the top. Uh, and the first thing you do is identify which of those pests are uh, actual concern on the farm you're interested in. So you can click and categorize them as uh, a big issue, a slight issue, or a moderate issue on the particular farm. And then thereafter, you can just focus on those particular pests. Uh, you can see, for example, if you've clicked on slugs as an issue, uh, there's an immediate link to guidance from the HDB website <coughs> about slugs and more general guidance on insect pests or invertebrate pests in wheat up there. Uh, and then to guide the thinking further, if you come down the column, you see a series of question marks, and those question marks line up with a particular IPM uh, interventions that you could use and the question marks are essentially guiding you towards interventions that are relevant for that pest and if you just hover the mouse over a particular intervention it gives you a sort of pop-up box that gives a bit of kind of quick practical guidance about the relevance of that uh, IPM intervention method in this case drilling uh, to slugs and then having kind of a quick look at that you can click on the question mark, a drop down box appears, and essentially it's a way of recording whether that intervention is already in use on that farm, or whether you intend to put it into use in future, or whether it's not appropriate for that farm. And basically you run through these question marks for the pests of interest, and that's the job done. So what we found was uh, 94 farms completed land management plans as part of the project. Um, in the immediate feedback, 88% of that group said they would recommend the process to others, which was quite amazing, I thought. Uh, although we have to bear in mind, this was a kind of self-selecting group of farmers who were sufficiently interested to opt in to a project. So we need to bear that in mind. Uh, typically, completing a land management plan for one took between one and two hours. So even if you had several crop types, it seems feasible to complete such plans. Uh, and the really encouraging thing for me certainly was the commitment in the plans to increase implementation of IPM. Crop type between two and 21% for grassland, 12 and 38% for arable crops, uh, increase in the number of interventions of IPM, um, which were going to be planned in the short or long term compared to current practice. So that was encouraging. <clears throat> okay, then on the question of how much uh, advice or guidance was needed to complete a plan, there's kind of two apparently opposing things going on here. Um, one is that the uh, level of guidance that was received didn't change the completion rates, you know, how many people successfully completed the plans didn't change. Um, and the level of commitment to increase IPM 
didn't change. Okay. Now, for agronomists, that might seem like bad news, but what we didn't assess in here was the quality of the decision making and the appropriateness of the interventions for a particular farm. Uh, and what the farmers came back and said was that 89% of them would continue to use IPM advice and guidance in future land management planning. And there was a strong preference that came back for face-to-face -face advice and agronomists' involvement in that process. And I think that's really about not necessarily driving the commitment or driving the completion of the land management plans, but driving the quality of what's done and the appropriateness of the decisions, making sure they're well informed. So our conclusion at the end of the project was that if we implemented these land management planning tools alongside the Sustainable Farming Incentive IPM standards, which are key to trigger payments potentially, we could enable farmers to create land management plans, guide users towards effective IPM methods, provide convenient links to guidance, and record current implementation and commitments to future implementation. And now this is sitting back with DEFRA at the moment for them to decide what they want to do as the next steps towards implementing this type of scheme. So it's in their court currently. Okay, now let's go back and look at lack of understanding or knowledge of IPM as a barrier and think about what's going on there and what we might collectively do about that. So the first thing I want to say is, is down at the bottom here uh, that maintaining effective control is an absolute prerequisite in all of this. We're not moving to IPM and losing control of things. Uh, and that's for two reasons. Obviously, for productivity and economics, we need to maintain good control. Uh, but also, uh, we published this work more than a decade ago now, showing that really efficient control of pests, weeds, and diseases is critical for greenhouse gas efficient crop production. It's no good having the greenhouse gas emissions associated with nitrogen use to build a crop canopy and then have it destroyed or competed with. So we need to maintain control. And the principles of doing that by ISPM are really quite nice and simple, at least as boiled down by AHDB, prevent, detect, and control. So, you know, kind of why is it so complicated? Um, and I think the reason it gets complicated is that those are generic principles that apply to everything, but the tactics of what you would do in an individual crop against an individual pest, weed, or disease are really quite specific, uh, and they differ a lot. So if we're considering a particular pest, and by pest here I mean a disease, an invertebrate, or a, a weed, um, for any particular pest, there'll be some combination of rotational choice, cultivation, the genetics of the variety, the agronomy, potentially biocontrol interventions, uh, which can combine together to reduce the need for conventional chemistry, but may not obviate that need. So then having done this, there's a question about how much um, plant protection product intervention is still required to treat according to need. And if we get all that right, then we get effective control. Uh, but even if we get effective control, we're still left with a couple of questions. Uh, one is, well, which of those interventions actually did the job? And would less intervention have still done the job? Uh, and then at the other end, when we do all these things, uh, we have quite wide ranging impacts that go way beyond the effect on the particular pest that we were interested in. So there's a kind of feedback. We do all these things, we change the rotation, cultivation, genetics, agronomy, and we hope we're gonna have a lot of nice positive effects on effectiveness of control, economics of the crop on the environment, uh, and reducing evolution of resistance against pesticides or virulence against varieties. But we have to recognize we could also in some cases have negative effects so what we do to control one pest 
might have a negative effect on another pest. Or, for example, we have a lower sowing date to reduce the risk of septoria, and then we have a, a sowing problem because the weather turns, and we have a negative effect on establishment uh, and economics. So this is the kind of um, complex of interaction. Look at what the evidence was in the literature for the effectiveness and other characteristics of different IPM uh, control measures. Uh, you'll notice uh, at least three of the authors of this review are in the audience now, so if there's any difficult questions, you can ask them. Um, they reviewed over 500 papers, articles, sources of online information globally about IPM, interpreted them for the UK situation, and that was just for four crop species, wheat, barley, or seed, and potatoes. They found uh, 40 different pests, so the weeds were grouped together, so annual grasses grouped together, for example, um, and pests. And, and if you multiply the number of pest species, 80, by the number of control measures, 40, you get 3,000 odd. So a lot of potential combinations, but of course they're not all relevant. So what you do against black grass in wheat is not the same as what you do against late blight in potatoes. But when they sifted through, they still found 600 control measure by pest combinations that are potentially relevant and then sifted through those uh, to find information about them. And at that point, you realize that 500 sources of information is actually Okay, this is one part of one table out of the review. Uh, the review has just been published. Uh, but I'd suggest you don't look at it now because it's 200 pages long and you'll miss the rest of the conference. But you can look at it at your leisure later. Uh, I'll just talk you through what's there. So the review contains a table like this for every pest or pest group in each of the crops. Okay, And this is just the example for one for septoria leaf blotch in wheat, but the structure of the tables is the same for everything. And what we did was just score things on a one to five scale where five is good and one is bad. And the main thing we were interested in was evidence for effectiveness of that intervention. And for comparison, we've given a score for the effectiveness of control by chemistry of septoria for this particular pest. And you can see with conventional chemistry, with robust programs, we still can contain uh, epidemics very effectively at the moment. Uh, and then that acts as a kind of comparative for the IPM measures. So what we've got is a whole bunch of different combinations. So here, for example, if we take rotation, uh, there's really quite good evidence. So this is a strength of evidence column. There's really very good evidence from the literature that rotation is a very poor control of septoria. Or alternatively, uh, let's just look here. There's really good evidence that varietal resistance against septoria can be quite effective. And there's all combinations in between of the strength of, ev of evidence and the degree of effectiveness. And you can go through those at your, at your leisure. <clears throat> then we got into more difficult territory where the evidence is often just not there and we have to rely quite a lot more on expert judgment, and your judgment on this might vary from ours. We accept that. Uh, what we tried to score subjectively was the kind of ease and cost of implementing the control measure, the economic importance. There is good evidence for this is the economic importance of septoria. It's high. Uh, and also what we tried to identify was where's the cases where current implementation is lower than the potential future use because if you've got something where it's not being fully implemented yet 
but there is good evidence that it would be effective and easy to implement, then that's clearly a priority for knowledge exchange. If you find something where there's pretty good evidence from the literature that it ought to be effective, so a good kind of rationale for it, but the strength of evidence is not quite there yet, then that becomes more of a priority for research. And part of the reason for doing this scoring was to try and help guide research priorities. And we give the sources of the information in each case here. Okay, so yeah, go to this link and look at uh, your leisure. And I really think we need some mechanism for getting collective feedback uh, and your experience and feeding that back into uh, the process about what works. And I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. <clears throat> okay, so the other um, part of the review was about how to get this knowledge across because there's a lot of it. So even though we've got knowledge gaps, you know, if you took all the information that's been written about IPM and you stacked it up on top of the other, you know, I think it would reach from the earth to total confusion. I mean, there's just loads of it. Um, but the structure to find it is not always very easy. So if we just look at the AHDB website, what we've got is guidance for an individual pest by control method combination. So how do you manage potato coal piles for potato blight manage management is one uh, guide that you can find. Or there's groups of pests and their control methods in a particular crop, the wheat disease management guide. Or there's groups of pests across multiple crops in the rotation, so managing weeds in arable rotations, as an example. Uh, or there's types of interventions against multiple pests, the recommended list resistance <coughs> ratings. Uh, and there's also project reports and reviews. Now, it would be good to get your feedback. Perhaps you're all really familiar with where all this guidance and information sits, and you can lay your fingers on it exactly when you want it. But for me, I don't think it's entirely straightforward always where to go and look. So one suggestion from the review was to set up a dashboard and basically align the guidance in a cropping cycle timeline. So when you're at a particular point in the season, you can click on the links that are relevant to the guidance for that part of the, part of the season. Uh, and also, by structuring the guidance in that way, it would form links that could be put into the Elm land management planning tool so they can be found when creating the land management plan. Uh, and then finally, there's a question about what we find when we go to the guidance, because a 200-page report, I mean, have any of you guys got time to read a 200-page report? I mean, I'm sure you'll dip into it, but really nobody has. So at those points, we need some text describing the factors to be considered in making the decision, uh, a decision guide in the form of a flowchart or some such, uh, and some kind of decision support, which may be a pest forecast, monitoring information, or a treatment threshold. So it's kind of shortened to the point. But just check how we are for time. Okay. Okay, so I just want to point out now two projects which are delivering some of this. So focusing on the decision support aspect, first of all, and by decision support, it can be a pest forecast, it can be a treatment threshold, it can be something more complex. So I just wanted to point out, this is the uh, home screen for a new platform funded by the European Union, so it's a pan-European platform to deliver decision support for IPM. And this platform will be launched in 2022, and there'll be a series of workshops in January and February this year, which we would very much welcome you to attend and give your feedback on the platform. You'll be able to use it uh, and give us your immediate thoughts on how it functions, and we can take that information away uh, and improve the platform. But essentially, the idea of the platform is to give access as a kind of one-stop shop to decision support 
but in a way that's really very quick and simple to use. So we actually had a group uh, a couple of weeks ago of about 30 people. We just gave them the link to the platform. We gave them a page of guidance and we left them alone. And it took them about half an hour from cold to go in, uh, create an account and log in, uh, add their farm or farms that they're interested in onto the platform, uh, put in the crops and pests that they were interested in, uh, select decision support systems they were interested to look at, and the platform then immediately automatically links the decision support system with the weather data for the locations of the farm, uh, and it comes with the free weather data is linked in, uh, and that allows you then to look at the decision support system risk outputs. Uh, and that whole process took that group from cold about half an hour. So it's not overly burdensome. And we think that once it's up and running and set up, it should only take about between two and five minutes to look at the risk forecasts. So it ought to be a, a quick uh, and simple job. Okay. So the platform will be there. But if you look elsewhere in Europe, there's been big investment by governments over decades in decision support. And the tools are there, they're well validated, and they're widely used and trusted. In the UK, that's kind of partially true. And it was interesting. We held a series of workshops about a year ago to get some preliminary uh, feedback on this platform and how it should look. We held 16 workshops across 12 countries, nearly 400 participants. Uh, and we asked the agronomists in the audience, this is the global or the European data, agronomists view, are DS decision support systems accurate? And you can see about two thirds said yes, uh, and about a third said no. We only gave two choices or no answer. But if you look at the UK, 20% said yes and half said no. So I think that shows a healthy level of skepticism. Uh, uh, but the other encouraging thing was we asked the question of the whole group, will decision support substitute or complement the work carried out by agronomists? And overwhelmingly 100% said it would complement rather than substitute. So I think there's something to go at here in getting engaged with decision support uh, working out what works and what doesn't collectively. And one way of doing that is on-farm demonstrations. And there's a sister project to IPM Decisions called IPM Works. And the web addresses are down here if you want to get involved. Um, and this IPM Works project is setting up a network of European demonstration farms for IPM. And the two in the UK, uh, one is run by LEAF and the other is run by the James Hutton Institute up in Scotland. Uh, and those will be um, the farmers and advisors and stakeholders, anybody involved in those demonstration hubs will decide what they're interested to look at, what the aspects of IPM are that they want to work on and demonstrations will then be set up in field to, to test out those different IPM interventions and essentially benchmark uh, and illustrate the performance of different strategies. If you can't read it at the bottom, ipmdecisions.net and ipmworks.net. Uh, and there'll be workshops, as I say, you can register for at those addresses. And these demonstrations will complement the work being done through AHDB on monitor farms and strategic farms. Okay, so I'll finish there. I mean, in essence, I think there's a good opportunity to incentivize IPM through environmental land management. Nobody is going to get rich through environmental land management incentives, but they do provide a steer and some incentive that could overcome some of those. Uh, barriers that we were looking at earlier and collectively I think we can enable IPM and 
you know, the agronomy industry has already shifted enormously in recent decades in that direction. And that's important because IPM is complicated. It's as likely, it seems to me, that good innovations in IPM are going to come from on farm as they are from research. So we need this two-way flow of information between farm uh, and research. And I think the agronomy industry is key in that two-way flow. So thank you. I'll leave it. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, I think you've shared some really useful insights into IPM and especially around IPM uptake. Um, and having been involved in, in nearly all of those projects, actually, it's been really helpful from an HDB perspective to think about how we communicate our information around IPM. Um, but also, as, as Neil said, I think that's some valuable insights for the agronomy industry as well in terms of how you work with your clients and enable that uptake. So just before I introduce our next speaker, just a reminder, if you have got any questions for our speakers to use the polyv function, so just a reminder, that's polyv.com forward slash HDB. So moving on, I'd like to introduce Phil Jarvis, who's chairman of the VI, and he's going to pick up on um, uh, a range of topics around IPM, uh, but something that Neil mentioned is around the economics. So we're going to look at how to make it pay for the business and the environment, as well as the future of IPM and how do we measure it. So thank you, Phil. Thank you very much indeed, Emily. And uh, can I first of all sound delighted that uh, AHDB has put IPM right at the front of an agronomy conference. Following on from last year's online conference where you had a whole day at the beginning, we're now seeing a theme right at the beginning. I'm also delighted that Sarah, your uh, roguing services are part of your IPM plan, so well done getting it straight off. But I, what I thought I'd first of all do is before I go into, and, I, and, and rather than how I've put does it pay, I, I just talk about the VI in general because you won't find a lot of the VI's work done on social media. You'll find it done in the rooms that are influencing and helping to, to share knowledge with, with government, with the industry, uh, and with agronomists and farmers especially, and, and, and probably as important as any of those are the operators on the ground. So uh, much of our approach is IPM based, uh, the voluntary initiative is 20 years old today, or, or this year certainly, and looked at that arena of non-regulatory areas and also trying to avoid a pesticide tax uh, from 20 years ago. So you'll be familiar, just a few snapshots about some of our strategies. So some of the measures around Neuroso, spray operators, spray testing, and IPM plans, a whole host of things. And, and the first one is integrated pest management and the risks, minimizing the risks for pesticide, for uh, groundwater, for wildlife, training and education, new metrics as well, and we'll talk a little bit about them, and science and evidence that takes the industry forward. We are food producers, but we're also uh, looking at uh, responsibility in the environment. And also, uh, what are the VIRs of government and, and how we work with government? So, Yes, with spray operating, there has been some problems around Neurosa with COVID affected, but we are catching up with spray testing and we're catching up in that arena. Uh, main messaging for IPM, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this, how the plan has evolved from uh, maybe 10 years ago in, into a, 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 maybe a, a plan and a survey, or sorry, a survey and assessment. And hopefully going forward, it will be a two-part plan. Assess where we are now and where we're going to in the future. Also, uh, we're looking at really important engagement with water companies and the water group is really a strong part of the VI's uh, engagement strategy. We've had a number of targeted webinars, three of them over the last uh, uh, nine months. Uh, and we've also had webinars on, um, on wildlife. Who are operators who will, uh, you know, um, deliver those messages into the industry. And also uh, with, with representation of crop tech, uh, and um, a number of information on, our, on the VI website as well. Uh, regular di dialogue with those who are in uh, charge with training, so City and Guilds, LEAF, BASIS, AHDB, um, and that's really important going forward. And that regular dialogue uh, will be important when we talk about what IPM looks like in the future. Um, also meeting with Henry Creason and Scottish Rural Colleges as well, and the Ferrell report that was done in conjunction with the VI and NFU to look at metrics in the future. Uh, 
positive interactions with the pesticide forum. So I've chaired two pesticide forum meetings this year. And of course, uh, a big part of the first month of my job was the national action plan um, and, and, and a response from the voluntary initiative in that area. And, and it's really important with engagement with ministers as well. So two meetings with Victoria Prentice, one with George Eustace, probably half a dozen with the DEFRA pesticides team. It's really important to put the industry's perspective across so that DEFRA have some joined up thinking. We have co-design, not just consultation as well. So that's a little brief snapshot of, of what's been going on, on, it, on, on in the VI the last few months. But we've already talked about this. What does IPM look like in the future? Well, I think the first thing, I think Neil alluded to it, is there's a lot that already goes on. And there's a lot that perhaps probably doesn't get recorded as such in the format that perhaps some people want to see it. But as agronomists and as farmers, there's a lot of this going on. I won't go into them in any detail at all because of time, but I think the recognition of this. The other thing that I will say now is that we have to remember that the human resources department on a lot of farms is quite limited. And I, I want to make sure that going forward, we don't have duplication. So we don't have an IPM plan in an assurance scheme and then an IPM plan in a standard. And basically, it's the same, same principles. It's just rejigged. And you're asking someone to do something twice. If we're going to do it once, let's do it once and let's do it properly. So there already is a lot that's being done on farm. There is also a lot that's been done with city and guilds and the ROSO and operators in the fields. And a certain amount of that knowledge is IPM knowledge. There's a lot done with spray testing and making sure that when we're applying plant protection products, they're done safely, they're done to the best of our abilities to plant them to produce the food at a cost that's affordable and minimizes environmental impact. We've also got integrated pest management plans, the current one, and there may well be in the future, various ones uh, in conjunction with AHDB, LEAF, standards, assurance schemes. We need to make sure that we've got these down into a, a, a system or a, a scheme that is simple, streamlined, as we were promised in Health and Harmony five years ago, the systems that we develop into the future will be streamlined and will be prioritized and proportional. It's a message I'd like to put forward to anybody who's watching this. And also the current offer of training, crop protection certificates through BASIS, beta conservation course, which I was involved with at Allerton for a number of years. There are a lot of advisors and many of you in the room who will start with an IPM approach as soon as you walk on the farm. So we have an offer that is there already, and it's about building on that uh, and taking uh, this sort of uh, training and taking the research on new methods forward that we need to encompass it in new plans. So what does it look like in the future? Well, there will be innovation. There will be technology. We've already seen about apps. Uh, we'll be embedding it in farming systems. We'll be using drones. We'll be using safer methods of not of, uh, transferring products into the spray tank. We'll be using natural-based solutions. We'll be using knowledge which is already out there to keep the plant protection product in the right place, working effectively, controlling disease management, weed management, and insect resistance. All those things will be really important in the future. And of course, we've already heard about prevent, protect, control, and IPM, and what it looks like at the moment. And the, the, the AHD web, website will no doubt develop in the future to encompass a much broader uh, collective. You'll also find that the uh, voluntary initiative has a lot of resources in those areas. So the new era that's evolving, well, it's evolving because there's a 25-year environment plan. There's a pathway, a transition, as we've left with Brexit. There's also really key, uh, and there's all these things around environmental land management, biodiversity, net gain, a local nature recovery, et cetera. There is it, the signposts are there for the industry, along with, of course, for, for food. Uh, and that is an ecosystem services for humans. So we shouldn't forget that. And, and you know, the, the discussion points and a point that's made quite a lot of times is about we can ignore all that and export and import, sorry, import our food from other parts of the world. Uh, it's all very well having a green and pleasant land here, but one of the aspirations in the 25-year plan is to be a global leader. So if we're going to be a global leader, let's have fair trade, fair conditions, fair standards, uh, safe, nutritious food for everybody, and especially fair for farmers in this country. And of course, going forward, the IPM is a major part of the revised National Action Plan. And I think going forward will be interesting. We've already had some feedback on what this looks like about the responses, about the definitions. And I think that will be crucial before we start formulating what IPM or what the government thinks IPM looks like. 
And I think this is where not just waiting for government, but helping to co-design what IPM looks like is really responsible of all of us in the room. So of course, we have some principles. We've had them for 10, 15, 20 years probably on IPM. Things that were in the Sustainable Use Directive uh, uh, and, and, and we've had those for many years and that's what our current offer is along. And we've heard about many of those and Neil's mentioned many of those there. We've also got something that's appearing here in the, in the consultation, which has caused some consternation within the industry around the fact that everything at the bottom here is better than everything here and better than anything here, because that's the implication here. But I would suggest that a multiple cult uh, cultivations here is not necessarily better than releasing hundreds and hundreds of lace swings into the environment and, and then saying that actually low residue, responsible, well-introduced, targeted chemistry uh, can't have it. And this should be a much more circular view rather than saying this is a traffic light system. But of course, that will dictate whatever comes out in the National Action Plan will dictate the industry way the industry has to respond. And of course, what IPM looks like in SFI and assurance schemes and how we brand it and market it in the future are all ways that we can make better use of uh, IPM for our businesses. And I noticed, for example, that last week, the SFI standards that came out on soil and grassland, you have now a standard coming out in 2023 for IPM. So, of course, we have a National Action Plan consultation. We have an SFI discussion about an IPM standard. We need to make sure we bring them all together and the certain parts of DEFRA talk to each other. So SFI talking to pesticide teams. So we come back with that streamlined approach, which are resources, a human resource department on farm. Otherwise, I think it will land on a lot of agronomists table. So uh, just a heads up there. So that summary of responses was quite in uh, of responses to the national action plan was there, and and I think it said about provision of advice to increase awareness, updated guidance for users, better communication, and also a widespread support using future schemes that reward farmers. And the other thing I'd say about all of this is that all those things in that triangle. There is an econ you probably find that you could rogue all your fields, for example. You could use biologicals. You could use biostimulants. You could put them on ad, ad infinitum. But if it isn't an economic cost, then where does the business stand? So there has to be a balance there. And I think this definition and the recognition of economics is really key uh, when the National Action Plan comes out. I just wanted to talk about IPM plans briefly. And this is the work that was done by Henry Creason, and it was about measuring the unmeasurable. So some of the things that we already do. And so looking at weighting of active ingredients, looking at surveys and monitoring, and developing a wider plan uh, and a mindset change, which is also one of the things that you mentioned in, in, in your uh, discussion talk, Neil. So I think all these things are what will appear in the IPM plans going forward, as I said assessment and survey first and then a plan for where you are in the future so a two point a two-part plan it will evolve in the future it will move forward in the future as we find new technologies coming through as we as we find systems developing in the future the plan will change and and it and has to be fleet of foot to do that to, to meet to meet the sort of farming that we'll be doing in the future i just wanted to um, say a few words about can it pay for business and the environment so for example you know Farmers' attitudes towards IPM have been positive, uh, but there are concerns about crop failures uh, and some of the financial implications around IPM. And this came from a, a comment from uh, Lacana Lundgren in 2018, which was just called regenerative farming. And IPM is very much part of that regenerative farming approach. Um, and all the principles of, of IPM can lead to economic benefit. So, you know, Machinery hygiene, you know, managing thresholds, monitoring, different modes of action, rotations, all those things can add to your and can improve your bottom line. Uh, and, and there they are, you know, pesticide selection uh, and also, you know, the monitoring as well. So just what I wanted to just put here, it's part of the system. So it's part of your, your no doubt, tremendous increase in, in, in groundswell, looking at regenerative approaches and integrated pest management approaches. You'll have found regenerative agriculture mentioned everywhere. You know, the principles of re regenerative agriculture, not just in this country, but globally as well. Uh, and we're all familiar with a number of the principles there. But the, the next slide is the one that I want to just concentrate on for a minute. 
uh, and this is this is this work was done from Cranfield, uh, Cranfield, Cranfield about uh, two or three years ago, and it's in this first box here. Now these are all the on-farm things around soil carbon and biodiversity, and you notice the colour gives you a bit of a clue whether it works or not. So this is this is the effectiveness. processes but when you come across to the ones about input costs and mean crop yield and margin of profit the, the evidence is less inclusive so I think this is the nut that we have to crack, crack to make sure to we convince a number of growers and people in the future to adopt these sorts of systems and of course IPM can be accommodated in food production efficiency productivity and marketing and we've already said uh, government investment in environmental. So those FSI, FSI standards on IPM will probably come with an economic uh, uh, cost with them, or there will be a cost with them, but there will also be a reward in them, hopefully. Um, but we need to make sure that they're coordinated and they're not replicated with things that might appear in assurance schemes. So my final slide really uh, is to say that there's a revamped voluntary initiative website that's on uh, uh, vi.org, uh, I think. Uh, my email address is there. Lots of resources on IPM management, uh, and not just on arable crops as well, on grass crops as well. So I'll leave it there. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Phil. Before you run away, would you like to come back onto the stage and take a seat and Neil and I'd also like to invite David Bell who's a farmer from Fife who's going to join the panel discussion today. So I think we've got some questions that have come in on Poly V but just before we go to those are there any questions from anyone in the room? If you want to pop your hand up we've got roving mics if not we can go to our Poly V questions. Okay. So, um, thank you very much for the great presentations. I think, you know, it really does set the scene for the conference today. So, let's start with the top question. What research is being conducted to the management, identification and threshold levels that's needed to maintain and support beneficial insects or control measures to reduce dependence on plant protection products and encourage beneficials for pest control? Neil, can I start with you on that one? Well, I can start. I don't know if Sasha's in the room, whether he's arriving this afternoon. Okay, my pet entomologist is not here, so I shall have to have a go myself. Uh, plant pathologist by training, so this will be a poor answer. Um, I mean, the contrast, I think, is between where beneficials and biocontrol sits in protected agriculture and where it sits in probable agriculture. I mean, the progress made in protected cropping has been absolutely huge and well embedded now for decades, uh, driven by two things. I think, firstly, market demand, uh, and secondly, the fact that you've got control over the environment and then can therefore control the environment and select beneficials that are going to be suitable for that environment and introduce them know that they're going to survive and do the job. Um, doing that out in the field is just far more difficult. So there's a lot of commercial interest in this area. There's quite a lot of work going on at a more blue skies <laughs> level and quite a lot of work across Europe in this area. But actually getting uh, biologicals, beneficials, biocontrol to work reliably out in the field is still proving a real challenge. Brilliant, thank you. I, I mean, could I just, just come oh, in now? Yeah, I mean, there, there has been work being done by CEH, and yeah. I think Richard Pywell in particular. Uh, there is work done by uh, individual plant. Uh, so Syngenta have done some stuff on insecticides as well and looking at low-residue chemistry. Uh, a number of studies that have been done, uh, the Allerton Project, for example, on, on natural uh, solutions as well so mm -hmm. there is research out there i mean it's perhaps a subject that going forward the hdb and 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 ukri could get involved more in mm -hmm. and and you're seeing out there at the moment the uk innovation farming innovation funds so there can be ideas that are coming off the floor for, mm -hmm. for the farming industry and and ukri have specifically gone out looking for farmer 
interventions in their innovation program. Yeah. Um, just just to add to that, so HDB have just been successful in an application for supporting an innovative farmers field lab. So that's looking at flower and grass margins and supporting beneficial insects for pest control. Um, and also across, across our strategic farms as well, we've got a number of sites that have been looking at. It's the same trial design actually as the assist projects that you mentioned, Phil. So um, I think there is that work going on out there. It's it's about tailoring it to your to your local situation and your local conditions on farm. So that kind of leads us on to, to the next question that I'm going to ask David to comment on, um, please. So it can take a long time to see the outcome of IBM. How can the impact of management decisions be measured? I'm interested in your perspective as a farmer. How do you do that on farm? How do you measure the impact of your decision making on IPM on farm? As a grower, as a farmer, um, we have to weigh up the benefit of the economic benefit and our, our long-term benefit. And generally, as a, as a farmer, we're, uh, we're in it for the long haul. So we're not just looking for the short fix. Um, so how do you measure these benefits? With uh, a feel for it, I mean, you, you know your own land, you know your own uh, productions. and you'll be able to find the, the the beneficial insects if you're reducing your insecticide use if you're using flower margins uh, if, if the crops are still viable and successful when you're when you remove an insecticide from from the whole farm uh, you know you're doing the right thing you can measure these it's a lot harder to to measure and to to go back to um uh, henry christian's um kind of tagline measure the unmeasurable uh, with IPM and, and it really is a challenge but you, you have to feel for it. it's more of an, uh, 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 more of an art than a science uh, and we have to really be um, more in tune with our land and our production methods I think to, to measure. There's, there's also every farmer can trial something not necessarily in a well replicated trial but if you want to change your approach you change your mindset start small two tram lines I know, Dave, you've done some trials on your farm and cultivations, and certainly in my, in my previous job at the Allison Project, we did lots of work on <coughs> trials to start small, and then you can expand if it actually works. Yeah, it, we have our own ground, and you, if you want some, if you want to learn something, do it in your own ground. It, it's the best way of, of learning is, is to, to collaborate with uh, with other growers or with other organisations. HDB is, is very uh, great at this with the Farm Excellence Platform. Um, the Monarch Farms and again researchers onto onto farms and uh, yeah it, it's it, it's just engaging and and finding things out for yourself. Don't stick with what you already know. There's always marginal gains to be had, and if you don't try it yourself, uh, you're you're relying on someone else to give you uh, that advice or that uh, experience. And I think. Uh, and getting your, your hands dirty in within research or within your own farm or ground is is and even as agronomists, you all know farmers who who maybe stick with the regimented plan of what is always done, but you just tweak them a little bit, just try and uh, try and draw them out into getting more engaged with you, and um, so that they they better uh, learn from your advice uh, and an interaction. I think. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so just. Final few questions. There are obviously you can see there are more up here, so I think we'll have to con continue this conversation over refreshment and lunch break. But our speakers will be with us today, so you'll be able to catch up with them. Um, Neil, final couple of questions to you around the IPM decisions project. So, can we put the IPM decision tool into software packages like Gatekeeper and Muddy Boots? And then there's a second question: Can the IPM decisions platform be used in Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland? So. The first one, there's already discussions going on with some of the farm management software companies. Um, the critical point about the IPM decisions platform is that it's open source and it's freely available. So any software company developing a farm management software package, for example, can just reach inside IPM decisions and pull the data out and extract what's there the personal data of users is very strongly protected by the general data protection regulations but apart from that everything can just be pulled through 
So our hope and intention is that a lot of what's presented in that platform will actually be sucked out and provided through file management software uh, in due course. Um, I, I think the other thing is it, it, it's essential if we want to encourage more people to do this, that it has to be available for everybody at whatever level they come into this. And on the question about uh, to, into Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, also the, this is the United Kingdom where we, we currently have um, you know, policies which may devolve in some areas, but around this area, I mean, Dave, I don't know if you want to comment on the Scottish position, we have to have a unified picture as well on, on IPM and what's available. So these tools do have to go into all the systems. Yeah, hands up, I asked a question. Uh, about the <laughs> but Thank uh, you but yeah, um, it's just uh, as, as, as one of the, the um, devolved nations, uh, it's, uh, it's always seems to be a, a more England-centric uh, mapping. I mean, the map showed it without a Wales and a Northern Ireland. Uh, it's a smaller country, but we're all in it together. And uh, we're UK uh, still, just now anyway. Um, so, uh, let, yeah, it's just highlighting that, that uh, it's not just south of the border. So just to, to answer that directly, the, the data to drive the system is there for the whole of Europe. So everywhere. Um, what limits the use is where the particular systems have been tested, well, originated, often tested and validated. And that's the critical thing, that they need to be picked up and used and validated within particular environments on farming. I would go back to the previous discussion about how we work out what works in IPM, whether that's decision support or whatever. <laughs> if we all wait for research to provide all the answers, we're going to wait a long time. If you ask me, for example, do fungicides against septoria pay? We compare without fungicides, with fungicides. There's your answer over a lot of seasons. But if you ask me, does IPM pay? What do you compare with what? A farm that's completely implemented a high level of IPM against one that hasn't. One particular IPM intervention against one particular pest. All of the hundreds of combinations in between. From a research point of view, it's a really difficult question to answer, but collectively, large numbers of farmers, advisors, doing tramline trials, finding out what works, sharing that knowledge, that can be really powerful, put alongside the research. So I think David's just volunteered himself to test out all of the uh, decision <laughs> support tools. Well, I think it's Final a, comment, a, David, quite a everyone. crucial point there as well, that um, as agronomists, you're all giving advice um, of, of what to put on the crop or what, what method to do, but what sometimes is, is uh, not being recorded is what you don't do, um, why you don't do. If you're, if you're meeting, meeting certain uh, IPM thresholds, um, you're, 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 you're maybe not uh, telling the grower um, why you're not applying a, a product or doing a, a process. And we need to start recording the reasons why we don't do uh, an application or, we, or, or why we're, we're not needing to do an insecticide or a, or a fungicide if we don't reach, reach a threshold. And it's this um, um, uh, data that's being lost in the system. Um, it, it's almost as, just as important as why we want to spray and why we don't want to spray. Well, and, we, do, uh, we, do, we do have to be very careful that we don't have layers and layers at field level, 20 or 30 different maps where suddenly every week you've got to do this. So I think, you know, making sure that um, it's a robust system, but it still has to be streamlined. Otherwise, it will it will just be bureaucracy and administration, and we have to be really careful about that. But in principle, yes, there's any technology that can help us with that. Great. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. I think, as I said, we could we could keep this conversation going all day, um, but we'll draw it to a close there. Um, if you can join me and thank our speakers and and uh, panel discussion for the first session. Thank you.